I think the best way to start this lesson is by clearing some of the obstacles out of the way. Now, let's start with something like air resistance, which is very much part of our everyday lives. You see, it is so much part of our everyday lives that we are hardly aware of it. But you know, if you would, for instance, jump out of an aeroplane and you open your parachute, then you're going to be very, very grateful that there is such a thing as air resistance. So it does come in very handy. But the problem is, if you have to do a calculation or you have to plot a graph of a projectile and you have to take air resistance into consideration, it is really very, very much of a nuisance, then it is not a pleasure. But thanks heavens, in our syllabus, we don't have to take air resistance into consideration. And that's why you will see that in most questions, they will have something like, for instance, that they would say, ignore the effects of friction. Or they might say, neglect air resistance or ignore air resistance. Remember that the effects of friction, that includes air resistance. Now, if we can then ignore air resistance, if we don't have to take that into account, and we now think about a projectile, what are the forces then that are acting on that projectile? Now, what one must remember at this instance is that whenever you think about a projectile, Please remember that if you would throw something while that object is in your hand, it's not yet a projectile. It's only from the moment that it leaves your hand until that instant, just before it hits the ground, that it is a projectile. So we are not going, in this lesson, we are not going to look at the object while it is in your hand, and we are not going to look at the object after it hits the ground. We are just going to look at while it is in the air. And if there's no air resistance acting on it, then what forces are acting on it? Just the weight. And we know that weight always acts downwards right to the center of the earth. Now, if you would, for instance, think about a cricket ball and it travels a path more or less something like this. Then, if there's no air resistance, we are allowed to think of it as no air resistance. If there's no air resistance, and that cricket ball is at this point, the only force acting on it will just be its weight downwards. When it's at that point, weight downwards. When it's at that point, weight downwards. Weight downwards. It doesn't matter what path it follows. The only force, and therefore the net force, will just be its weight acting downwards. One is tempted to think the fact that it's moving in that direction, that there are other forces. Remember, there was a force acting on it way back when that ball was thrown. But that force is now removed. It's not there anymore. The only force, the moment it leaves your hand, is just the weight acting downwards. Now the good news is that we don't even have to consider two-dimensional projectiles like this. We are only going to look at one-dimensional motion, which means motion in a straight line. We are just going to look at projectiles that move up and straight down along the same line, exactly the same line, up and down. That is one-dimensional motion. And even for that projectile, the only force acting on it, while it's going up at the highest point and while coming down, is just its weight downwards. Now, our clever friend, Mr. Isaac Newton, he taught us that if there's a net force acting on a body, that force is going to accelerate in the direction of the force. So if the only force acting on that body is just its weight, it means the weight is the net force, and that means that the body is going to accelerate due to that net force in the direction of the force, which is down. 
In other words, and this is crucial to understand, while this object is going upwards, the weight is acting downwards, the acceleration is downwards in the direction of the weight. When the body reaches the highest point, the weight is still there acting downwards and therefore the acceleration will still be downwards. When the body turns around and it falls back, the weight is still there acting downwards, therefore the acceleration is still going downwards. Let's summarize. While this object is traveling upwards at the highest point and traveling downwards, throughout this motion, the weight is acting downwards. And therefore, throughout this motion, the acceleration is downwards. What do we call that acceleration due to the gravitational force, the weight? It's called gravitational acceleration. And gravitational acceleration will always, always be down, whatever that body is doing. Whether it's going upwards at the highest point or whether it's coming downwards, it will have its gravitational acceleration acting downwards. It doesn't change to upwards or anything like that. It will always, always be downwards. And what's more, on the data sheet, they tell us that this gravitational acceleration has got a value on the Earth's surface where we live. It's got a value of 9.8 meters per second squared. So what do we know? We know that for a projectile, the acceleration will always be 9.8 meters per second squared down, no matter in what direction it's traveling. That will be the gravitational acceleration. Now, the second obstacle that we should take into account is that whenever you do calculations involving vector quantities, now, let's first see what is a vector quantity. You've learned previously that a vector quantity is a physical quantity that's got both magnitude and direction. Now, whenever you deal with vector quantities, whether it's electric field strength or momentum or force, acceleration, impulse, anything that's a vector quantity. Whenever you see, I've got a problem coming up I, that I have to do involving a vector quantity. It's not just good advice. It is compulsory that you start of step number one to determine what direction is positive and what direction is negative. We work just in two directions, fortunately. Remember I said one-dimensional motion? That means along a straight line. It can just have two directions, up and down or left and right or whatever. But you can just have a positive and a negative direction. But now, in some problems, the examiner or the question will state in a very clear fashion what the direction is. They might say, up is taken as positive or down is positive. Then you don't have a choice. You'll have to take that. But sometimes they test your IQ and they would sort of, you have to read between the lines. You have to figure out for yourself what direction is positive. For instance, they might say that a stone is projected upwards at a velocity of 30 meters per second. Now we know that if something hasn't got a sign, we assume that it's positive. So they might have as well have said, it's projected upwards at a velocity of plus 30 meters per second. That is, they tell you, up is positive. You see, not in a straightforward fashion, but still, they imply that up will be taken as positive. Then still, you don't have a choice. But quite often, you find that in a question, they don't give you any indication whatsoever whether the velocity, or sorry, what direction, is positive and which one is negative. Now, I promise you, there is no law in this country that tells you that you have to take up as positive or that you have to take down as positive. You take your favorite direction as positive. If you like up, you take up as positive. If you like down, you take down as positive. Although it's good practice, but it's honestly not a law. Uh, it's good practice to always take the initial direction 
as positive, but it really doesn't matter if you do it the other way around. So in other words, before you start with a problem that involves vector quantities, you have to check whether they give you any indication as to what direction is positive and what direction is negative. If not, you decide, I am going to take this or that as positive. 